It is my great pleasure tonight to welcome the speaker, uh, Mr. the Honourable Campbell Newman. Uh, Campbell Newman was born in 1963 in Canberra, uh, was raised in Tasmania and returned to, ta uh, returned to Canberra uh, before joining the Royal Military College in Duntroon uh, as a staff cadet in the Australian Army. Uh, his father, Kevin, represented the federal seat of Bass in Tasmania and was a minister in the Fraser government, while his mother, Jocelyn, was a senator for Tasmania and a minister in the Howard government. Uh, Campbell uh, <coughs> joined the Australian Army as a staff cadet in, uh, at Duntroon in 1981, uh, graduating in 1985 as a lieutenant and retired in 1993 at the, at the rank of major. He has an honours degree in civil engineering from the University of New South Wales and an MBA from the University of Queensland. After moving to Queensland, he worked as a consultant in a number of businesses before he was elected as Lord Mayor of Brisbane in 2004. He served in that role until 2011, where he was responsible for a raft of infrastructure and other projects. At the 2010 World Mayor Prize, he was declared the fifth best mayor in the world. <laughs> 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 He received national attention, earning the nickname Can Do Newman. Such was his popularity that he was drafted to lead the Liberal Nationals for the 2012 state election uh, and has the rare feat of being the only post-federation leader of a political party to lead the party to the government benches from outside of the parliament. He subsequently led the Liberal Nationals to the biggest electoral wipeout in Australian history <laughs> with a... <laughs> with the Liberal National Party winning 78 seats uh, in the Queensland Parliament, leaving the Labor opposition to only seven. The swing was 14.5%. From 2012 to 2015, he served as the 38th Premier of Queensland, following in the footsteps of Sir Samuel Griffith so many years ago, the 9th Premier of Queensland. He was responsible for many worthwhile but difficult reforms, including reducing hospital waiting times, reforming the state finances, uh, and tackling serious crimes. It was no coincidence that uh, during his premiership, Victoria became home to an increasing amount of migrating bikey gangs. <laughs> uh, since leaving the parliament, Campbell is perhaps best known for his hard-hitting commentary on Sky News. Uh, we are very lucky and privileged to have him and his lovely wife, Lisa, here tonight. And we look forward to hearing him speak on the topic, not all smart people are in Canberra. Please join me <laughs> in welcoming Campbell Newman. Thanks very much, uh, Morgan, and uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's an absolute uh, pleasure to be here this evening. And I've got to say, very intimidating as well, because uh, this is uh, a very uh, high-powered audience. Um, and I don't give too many speeches these days. I just tend to get on Sky and rant with people like my friend Andrew Bolt, etc. But I'll move on. And I meant that in the nicest possible way. I'd just like to acknowledge uh, the executive of the Samuel Griffith Society. And uh, look, there are many dignitaries here this evening, you know, uh, members of parliament, senators, uh, judges, former judges, uh, and I'm actually honoured to, to be thought uh, worthy to, to say a few words this evening. So tonight, the, the title of my address is this. It's Not All the Smart People Are in Canberra, or subtitled, A Call for True Competitive Federalism. My topic, of course, of, is, is very much, of course, uh, tongue-in-cheek, but it's actually a very important point because there is an undercurrent in our national debate that implies, sometimes it's very close to the surface, that all the smart people are in Canberra and that's where all the solutions to the nation's problems lie. On the contrary, tonight I make the case for refresh of our federation. I'm going to stop for a moment, like maybe I'll use reform later on. I want to, I looked at the website this evening before I came and I went, oh my God, they love the constitution, they don't want to change. So I'm just up front, you know, I'm, I'm, <laughs> this is, look, just, just bear with me, okay? It's a, it's a refresh uh, of uh, our federation where we realise that right across this country, there are people in state, territory, local governments and indeed the broader community that can do a better job if we get the federal government out of the way and empower them. That's what I'm about this evening. 
these people are, of course, smart. They have great ideas, and if they're allowed to get on and deliver their own solutions to local challenges, we would indeed be a better country. So tonight I'm going to cover the following. Where we have come from, where we are right now, uh, a bit of a dissertation on the problems that arise from this situation, what I believe, humbly, a true federation should and could deliver, and perhaps some political thoughts on how we go forward, how we could make this happen. So let's get into it. Where have we come from? Well, 130 years ago, a group of talented and far-sighted politicians, I'll stop again there, they were probably bagged just as much by the media back then as our current crop of politicians are as well, but they were talented, they were far-sighted, uh, they kicked off a process that ultimately saw the federation of a group of British colonies as a new, united and democratic nation. Over years of discussion, negotiation, fights, public debate, huge doses of pragmatism, a constitution was hammered out and Australia was born. Critically, it was a political process. It was not a bureaucratic process. It was not led by the public service. Public servants supported the process, but it was the political leaders of the time that did the deal. Their vision was one of a true federation with dispersed power, and it is evident, of course, everyone here knows this, in the words of our constitution. Certain powers were vested in the Commonwealth, national defence, external affairs, and everything else, and I know Ian Callan is here, he'll correct me if I get this wrong, everything else belonged to the states. Pretty much that's the case. And I note <coughs> that it's a historic fact that the architects of the federation cast the net widely for a model of the federation that would suit Australia. They looked at Switzerland, they looked at Canada, and discounted it, by the way, because, and uh, as I understand, and this is a bit ironic, uh, they saw it as being too centralised, and today we would probably see it as the, absolutely the contrary. They'd see it as far more a, a true federation. They borrowed, of course, as we know, heavily from the US model because they were concerned to protect states' rights. And of course, our Senate was not only designed as a house of review, it was a place where the interests of even the smaller states uh, would be protected. Well, ladies and gentlemen, for a period of time, probably a very short period of time, this worked reasonably well until we came to our involvement in World War I and the pain of the Great Depression. The cataclysmic economic forces undoubtedly required the Commonwealth to intervene for the clear goal of national survival. However, as we know, when the crisis abated, the people from Canberra stayed to help us all. <laughs> Moving forward, 120 years from Federation, and where have we come to? Well, everyone in this room knows where we've got to. Nevertheless, for the purposes of the argument, I'm going to spell it out. After 120 years of High Court decisions and interpretation of our Constitution, plus the exigencies of war, the Federation is far removed from what the Founding Fathers intended. The centralists in Canberra are delighted, but the results are not leading us to the Promised Land or a new Jerusalem. We have totally confused responsibilities. We have duplication and we have overlap. That's the order of the day. Prime Ministers and members of the Federal Cabinet pay absolute lip service to the Constitution, if that at all, and a degree of arrogance permeates like a miasma from Canberra across the continent. The media, the media compound the problem clearly, showing on a daily basis that despite being political reporters, all with, by the way, tertiary qualifications, most have limited knowledge about how things are actually meant to work and absolutely no sense of history whatsoever. And finally, we turn to the public, the poor, long-suffering members of the Australian public who wonder why stuff doesn't happen and are fed up with blame-shifting and buck-passing. One night, they turn on the TV and hear their state minister talking about education. 
the next night or even the same night. It's Simon Birmingham, seemingly <laughs> unfazed by his battle with Catholic education, making out that, no, no, it's him. He is in charge. For the record, Minister Birmingham, you don't have any schools, but you do have a bucket load of federal public servants that don't run any schools as well. And of course, we have to ask why. Why? Why can't the overall policy settings, because that's really what the Commonwealth should be doing in such a situation, be handled by a much smaller and more efficient bureaucracy? But I'm not just going to point it at him or the feds. What about the state ministers and territory ministers of education? Why don't they step up and take responsibility because it is their responsibility for the education outcomes in our schools? And I ask you, is there any wonder why the public are confused and disillusioned? So what are the main problems with our federation? Well, these are the high level ones. Well, the, the evolution of our federation has taken us to a place now where the state and Territory First Ministers have been like a bunch of infants. They all act and sound like mendicants because, ladies and gentlemen, they are. They and their ministers have been elected to be responsible for their respective states and territories. However, they endure a Prime Minister and Federal Cabinet who want to constantly weigh in on matters that at 1901, at the start point of this whole enterprise, weren't anything to do with them. None of their business. So they've got to cope with that. At a most fundamental level, of course, the issue is with money, and most precisely, the vertical fiscal imbalance. I almost got chucked off a Sky News show the other day for talking about this too much. That sees Canberra collect almost all the loot, talk loudly about delivery, while the states, and let's not forget local government, they're the bunnies who actually have to deliver stuff on limited revenue raising powers and with the grants that Canberra chooses to provide. And it's not Canberra's money, by the way. As Scott Morrison, the Federal Treasurer, says quite rightly, it's the people of Australia's money. I agree with Scott. And I'll add most emphatically that they deserve better. God, do they deserve better. The states and territories must have direct access to own source income to pay for their responsibilities without relying on the political whims of Canberra. More bluntly, those that have the responsibility to fund the important services and infrastructure need to get that funding without interference or political engineering via so-called national partnerships from the feds. I turn now to that other great, well, not so great, Fed Federation acronym, which is the other one. The, other one was, the first one was VFI, the other one's horizontal fiscal equalisation. Now, essentially, this is a socialist notion, straight from the good old Aussie concept of the fair go. It means that states like New South Wales and Victoria have subsidised everyone else for 100 years. Then at the very moment that WA comes into some real money, it gets taken off them. <laughs> In the meantime, it means that states like South Australia and Tasmania can go on a frolic and indulge themselves with particular political administrations who over the past 20 years have been anti-development and anti-business. What about Queensland? Whoops. Could, I hope I've got police escort on the way home. <laughs> well, Queensland has done well being subsidised by others and was on its way to financial independence, but that prospect is now diminishing as a mountain of debt and interest payments crush the ability of the state government to pay for the things that Queenslanders deserve and must have, ultimately. But my big thought this evening is that HFE is a fig leaf for state and federal... Uh, sorry, state and territory governments that won't perform. Why not be a Premier when you have, as the years go by, fewer responsibilities and less control over the outcomes? Just blame Canberra. Why be a low-tax state when the formula assumes that you're taxing at a higher level and nets out the initiative that you've tried to create for the economic growth of the state and effectively penalises you? Why do it? Why open up your state's gas fields or mineral resources generating royalty revenue when that's politically painful and HFE will bail you out anyway? Why do it? 
WA will pay, for example. My point is this, that HFE squashes independence and innovation and provides absolutely no incentive for states and territories to do the heavy lifting. Before I leave the topic, though, of what is wrong with the, the way that our federation is operating, I need to convey a few thoughts and then some examples on the perils of centralisation, which is really about human nature, according to yours truly. To lead into this, I must say I've always been nonplussed because I've got this reputation in the media as being some sort of control freak. Yes, I'm tough, but the truth is, and David Crisofoli will be telling stories later at the bar, <laughs> the truth is that I am and always have been someone that believes in a delegation of authority and responsibility at the lowest possible level. Just if you get it wrong, I'm going to come after you. Hey, David. <laughs> Not that he did. In war, General Sir John Monash understood and went to great pains to ensure that his frontline soldiers needed to understand his plan and his junior leaders were empowered to react to changed circumstances on the battlefield and take action to use their initiative, albeit consistent with the overall plan, which they understood. This is also the case in business, in business enterprise. My view, therefore, is that the best leaders tell people what is expected of them, give them clear guidelines, provide the necessary resources and let people get on with the job. Micromanagement is detrimental to the human spirit. It quells initiative and it leads to poor performance. People who are given the freedom to act, ladies and gentlemen, within clear guidelines, develop as individuals and achieve powerful results. As it is on the battlefield and in the competitive world of business, so it is in politics and government. However, the paradigm that now prevails is that the smart people are all in Canberra, that the second 11 work in the states and territories, and whether it be the politicians or the public servants, the main game is seen to be in Canberra. And if you're any good, that's where you should be. The backstory, and I think this is actually, I don't think I'm overdoing it here, the backstory seems to be that the feds are the only ones that could come in and sort out the mess that those idiots at state level have created. That's just wrong. Decentralisation of decision making is, I believe, a very important principle, therefore, for any system of government. People on the spot are usually better placed to identify and analyse issues, develop responses and effectively implement solutions. Furthermore, the idea that a country as vast as Australia, with people sitting in Canberra, can tailor policies that work for communities from, say, Huonville in Tasmania to Thursday Island at the tip of Cape York, um, from St Peter's in Sydney, uh, the traditional lands of the Newmans, to Narragin in WA is totally laughable. It's hard enough doing this at a state level, and that's why when I was in government, we took a number of steps to delegate authority to local governments and make mayors more powerful and accountable to their communities. And David uh, was my minister leading the charge uh, across Queensland on that. Just to note some of the perils of centralisation, in case you still don't believe me, lack of local knowledge, lack of responsiveness, decision avoidance, and it's anti-democratic. There's a tyranny almost. I really get concerned when I see people protesting in inner city Melbourne somehow dictating to regional Queenslanders that they can't have a project like the Adani project that promises jobs and a future for them and their kids. My firm view is that our system should be about empowering state and territory leaders and letting them solve their own problems and being accountable to their own communities. I've got a bit of a story here which I think might further illustrate it. Maybe I'm overdoing it. I don't know. No. This might be a bit, a bit heavy at this hour of the night. But it's about the National Heavy Vehicle Regulator, a Rudd government initiative, but I'm sad to say implemented by the Abbott government. It's instructive. Established in 2013, the vision was this, of a seamless, harmonised system greasing the wheels of the nation's logistics and trucking operators Immediately upon implementation, things fell in a big heap. Today, and I checked the other day, from their website, they say they're about minimising the, compl 
the compliance burden. It's hard not to laugh. <laughs> Reducing duplication of and inconsistencies in heavy vehicle regulation across state and territory borders and providing leadership, driving sustainable improvement to safety, productivity and efficiency outcomes. Well, they've got a long way to go. Uh, as Premier back in 2013-2014, I was besieged uh, with complaints from the trucking industry and farmers about a huge blowout in the time to process uh, permits for the movement of heavy and oversized loads. Farmers, for example, uh, with cane farms astride the Bruce Highway in North Queensland, who merely wanted to move a large piece of agricultural machinery 500 metres down the Bruce Highway from this side of the farm, well, this part of the farm to the other part of the farm on the other side of the Bruce Highway, were waiting and screaming because they couldn't get permits to simply move that bit of, bit of kit. <laughs> if you think it's been solved now in terms of these issues, we'll think again. Um, because I'm on Sky News, I was approached uh, in May this year by a trucking industry group who is still concerned about a lack of responsiveness and the inability to receive permits in a timely fashion. Mining equipment, and I've got two examples here, mining equipment being relocated by heavy haulage from the Pilbara to Weeper had to be barged across the Gulf of Carpentaria as after 100 days no permit had been issued to travel through Queensland. Um, whereas in WA in the Northern Territory, permits could be issued in two days and neither jurisdictions, I'm told, are signatories to the National Heavy Vehicle Law. Second example, rail equipment needed for iron ore rail uh, lines and ready uh, in April this year. It was stuck in Sydney until at least, least mid-July, I'm told, as the South Australian police were unable to provide load escort services at the time. It's not just the NHVR's fault, by the way. Because the NHVR exists, the state jurisdictions have sort of sat back and gone, well, it's not our problem anymore and no one cares, and no one's accountable. And which politician do you talk to when you're a farmer at Ingham who wants to see your bit of kit moved? Who do you complain to? My point is we had a pretty good system that served us well where local decisions were made in a timely and effective manner. And the final irony is this. Where do you think the National Heavy Vehicle Regulator is headquartered? It's here in Brisbane. It's just up the hill. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> enough of the problems. What are the benefits that we would see if we could make Federation work properly? Well, firstly, we get a chance to reduce waste and duplication and better utilise the resources that we have as a nation. In short, we do a better job for Australians. Secondly, we get to keep faith with the public and actually restore their faith in the system by reducing the blame game and looking like the political and media class actually have a clue. Thirdly, we empower and motivate smart people in places other than Canberra to truly lead. Premiers, ministers, mayors and local government councillors can do a better job, ladies and gentlemen, if we actually let them. Fourthly, we strip away this fig leaf, creating true competitive federalism and this situation is then one where states and territories have a greater array of policy levers at their disposal and therefore must stand up and be counted. They will be held to account by their communities. And finally, <clears throat> Australians will have the opportunity to compare and contrast and ultimately, should they wish, the opportunity to live in the jurisdictions that are delivering. Now, if you think this is a bit starry-eyed, before I move on, I just remind you that when Joe ended death duties in this state, not only did the state see an influx of retirees, but the tax was then eliminated nationally shortly thereafter. Yeah. <clears throat> now we get to the hard part. So how do we do this? So let's get real. Firstly, let's, let's speak the truth here. Canberra has absolutely no interest in seeing the matter resolved because going back to a proper federation as the founders envisaged, envisaged may well be in the national interest but sadly it's not actually in the day-to-day -day interest of the Commonwealth. It's just not. It's not in their interest. No, federation reform, I believe, needs to come from the state and territory first ministers. They may not agree on the specifics right now but surely they can agree that a broken system needs to be fixed 
if they stand together and demand a process of reform, that at least the start can be made. But there is an issue at the moment. They don't seem to be interested in having to rock the boat either. Hmm. So in summary, at the moment, I don't see any push from anyone to do anything. So it's got to come from us. It's got to come from us. That's what conferences like this are all about. That's what this society is all about. We need to kickstart a debate about federation, which perhaps gets those state and territory politicians thinking about it so we can get this thing moving. We need to try and talk to our fellow citizens on some of the things that I've mentioned tonight and get some sort of mood for change. We actually need to point out there, that if there is indeed a lack of performance by states and territories, it's actually a manifestation of the smothering fiscal love, can I call it that, that Canberra delivers. I've got to say that I watch with amazement and shake my head at the perennial but brief outbreaks of discussion about tax reform. And the Prime Minister went on a little excursion on this one and quickly retreated a couple of years ago now. Even more laughably is the suggestion that reform will happen uh, being led by Canberra. And additionally, it's implausible to think that we'll have effective and meaningful taxation reform without reform of the Federation itself. To be more pointed, and this is critically important, and I don't know why so many people in politics don't get this, federation reform comes before taxation reform. You cannot reform tax until you sort out VFI and HFE. If you get the roles and responsibilities sorted out, then it will be easier. Now, I didn't say easy. I said easier to sort out the tax issues and the VFI HFE debacle. So what am I saying this evening? Well, I'm saying it's time for a new compact between the Commonwealth, the states and the territories, and it needs to be, go back to my words at the beginning, it needs to be a deal done between political equals that is appreciative of our history, respectful to our traditions, and acknowledges that we can and should make things work better. It cannot be led by the Prime Minister's department doing a white paper. And the states and territories should not accept this. It must instead be led by the politicians themselves. As I said when I started the, this address this evening, federations, the Federation was led by politicians who crafted an audacious political bargain. And that is what I'm advocating now. If we're to get anywhere, the senior politicians in this country need to tear themselves away from Twitter, Facebook and the 24-hour news cycle and do some real work involving deep and considered thinking. I know, it's hard, it's hard and I've been there and you know what I feel for them, it's hard. It is really hard to find that time. But that's how this goes. We need them to lead the process and personally throw, thrash out those key issues, then provide the guidance to the public servants. The things that I saw when I was involved in COAG was we were sort of giving it to public servants to come up with white papers and then consider it. That's not the way to do this. The politicians have got to set the framework, do that work together, and then provide the instruction for those who have to thrash out the detail. Now, I'm not actually talking about constitutional amendments. You know, I was very scared. I told you before about the, the, the society website. Um, I'm a pragmatist. It would be nice if it could happen in some cases. Instead, though, what I'm advocating is a minimum, is a political deal that sees the following. The respective roles and responsibilities being agreed, because they're not clear at the moment. The responsibilities being defined and quantified the true funding requirements being estimated and a taxation deal being done. Now, this may mean that states give up certain things but reclaim full responsibility for others. It might mean, for example, that the NDIS could become a totally Commonwealth responsibility as part of the social security system, and I, did, I think that is totally logical. It may mean that the states get a share of Commonwealth income tax, collected, of course, by the Australian Taxation Office. 
How would this work? On day one of the new system, the state income tax component of the overall PAYG tax brackets would be the same everywhere. As time went on, the various jurisdictions could ask the feds to vary their component. The postcode of your principal place of residence would be a convenient coding flag to allow the automatic calculation of tax. What would be the impact if Tasmania decided to be the lowest tax state in Australia and became the preferred home of the wealthiest? It's not a bad place, ladies and gentlemen. If you have central heating, there is Mona, and they make really great wines of whiskey and gin these days. <laughs> and, how, and house prices in Hobart, thanks to the Hodgman government, are doing really well. I don't know about Launceston, but we hope they come along too. Finally, and this is my point, it may mean that the states and territories uh, would also adopt an improved, this is another example, of a fed, an improved federal environment law. So the feds have, there's a federal environment law, but you know what then? The states and territories adopt that, but then are responsible for implementation with their own borders rather than these double sort of uh, level approvals that are currently having to be done. Ladies and gentlemen, it's getting late. And this subject can be weighty, but never dreary, never dull. I trust, though, that I've enthused some of you, at least, for the conference program to come. It's actually really, really important stuff. Uh, to conclude, I just reflect that we do have a fantastic country. It's a great country. But sadly, at the moment, we do seem to be becalmed out in the middle of uh, the ocean. There are some other prescriptions, other things that may help with this, but the one that I passionately believe could make a huge difference is a concerted effort to redefine our federation and make it work. I hope that you share my passion for that dream. Thank you for having me this evening. Thank you for having Lisa as well. And have a great conference.